Alright, this is the third and final video for the HIP um, in this uh, Module 4, uh, moving on to the knee and ankle next. Um, the intention of the muscle video, uh, since this is the video and we're not in live class, uh, I probably will go into a little bit more detail, but I would definitely use this video more as a uh, study tool that you listen to more than once. Um, so the first few slides, maybe the first five or ten slides, will just kind of give you an introdu introduction. But I do have on the Blackboard shell that anatomy tour with the visible body software which I think is fabulous so make sure you you look through that video so we'll go through more specifics um, and help you with your studying the uh, expectation for you would be able to do um, I'm going to show you these video uh, muscles in terms of category uh, where they're at anatomically um, so anterior posterior medial lateral but these muscles really where you want to make sure that you're able to delineate between which muscles are agonists for certain movements so like hip flexion uh, or knee extension or ankle plantar flexion or more specifically when you're kicking a soccer ball or throwing a punch or uh, to be able to associate these particular movements with that move uh, with that th or these particular muscles with those particular movements so who's on who's off who's working concentrically who's working eccentrically so keep that in mind that uh, when you guys go through this that this should be something that you listen to multiple times or rewind and f uh, fast forward as you're taking your notes based on uh, which muscle you are looking at. So um, here is your musculature, um, quite a bit, and as I had said in a previous video that the bulk of the muscles for both the hip and the knee lie here on the thigh, and luckily a lot of these muscles are biarticulate, meaning they cross both the hip joint and the knee joint. So when you're learning these muscles uh, for the hip, you are inadvertently l learning the same muscles for the knee. So although it seems like quite a bit, these are all the muscles actually right here. Um, quite a bit to know in terms of origin, insertion, function, action. Um, but uh, you'll eventually know all this lower extremity and there's like I said quite a quite a bit of overlap so when we look at the uh, thigh uh, it's easier to divide it into four quadrants your anterior musculature stuff that's on the anterior side of the thigh the front of your leg posterior so your quad group versus your hamstring and then your lateral group uh, mostly your uh, glute uh, your hip musculature like glute medius glute minimus and then your medial group like your adductors uh, when you look at a cross section here, you can kind of see that again. Here's your anterior compartment, your medial compartment, and your posterior compartment. So here's your superficial view of the anterior musculature. You can see your quads there. You can see the iliopsoas, uh, the iliacus, and the psoas muscles. Uh, some of the adductors popping through, but the most prominent are the uh, the vastus muscles. Here's your rec fem, uh, vastus medialis, vastus lateralis. You can see some of the leg musculature here. Uh, we took the superficial layer out, took the quads out, and now you can see what's left with the adductors. So as you can see those pretty clear, you can see that makes this big muscle sheath here. Uh, we'll be going through those muscles in a little bit. Here's your posterior view, and the most dominant muscle you see here is the glute max. You can see a lot of the hamstring musculature. Uh, when, the ham when the glute max is taken away, you can see glute medius, uh, uh, and then underneath that is glute minimus. You can see piriformis. Uh, a lot of these are external hip rotators. And if we take go even deeper, you can see these deep external hip rotators, and now you're starting to get into the adductors again. So medial view, half the pelvis, here's all your adductors, your adductor complex. And then uh, here's your glute max, TFL, here's your IT band that's cut away, and then your glute um, minimus and glute medius. Okay, so um, what's nice is when you categorize these in uh, by anterior posterior, usually the muscles on that side of the axis are the ones that are participating. So the anterior muscles are primarily hip flexion. Not all of them, and not all muscles in the anterior hip flex, and not all hip flexors are in the anterior, but for the most part, the anterior muscles are uh, hip flexors, iliopsoas, the pectineus, rec fem, and uh, the sartorius. Uh, most of the medial muscles are adduction, so, ad, uh, so your ad adductors. And then your posterior are going to be your hip extensors, and then your lateral muscles are going to be hip abduction. So we're going to go into a little detail. And remember, this is the point where um, you'll go through each of these muscles. We might go through a little bit more detail, uh, but looking at primary function. So we've already had this muscle. We looked at it in the trunk and spine unit as a uh, lumbar stabilizer, pelvic hip flexor for, for sit-ups. Uh, but you have your psoas major. And uh, a lot of textbooks will you look at it as the iliopsoas, so it's the iliacus and the psoas. 
And the reason they do that is that the, the, the psoas and the iliacus, they converge and they become one muscle actually. And as you can see over here on this slide, here on this image here, um, they both uh, attach and they uh, insert down at the lesser trochanter. Um, so the iliacus, it originates up here in the uh, iliac fossa. So on the inside of your iliac, here's your ASIS, there's your AIIS, here's your iliac crest. So this is your abdominal wall. And just inside the bowl, the pelvis is your iliacus. Um, and so it's a monoarticulate muscle. It crosses one joint. It just crosses right here. It goes from um, from here oops, to there. That's your iliacus. Now your psoas, as we remember from uh, last uh, unit, last module, that it originates here on these uh, lumbar bodies and on these transverse processes of the all the lumbar vertebra. And it comes down and it crosses both the lumbar spine and the pelvis down and attaches the same exact point. So that's why they're usually referred to together uh, as the iliopsoas, but really the psoas major. And there's a psoas minor in a part of the population. There's an iliacus and an iliacus minor in the pop, but, but they all do the same thing. They do hip flexion. They do lumbar flexion because they'll bring, if you see these arrows here, they're bringing these two ends closer together. And then based on the trochanter, it will actually do a little bit of external rotation and hip flexion. So it's a hip flexor, trunk flexor, and external hip rotator. So this shows just the iliacus instead of the psoas as the movement, but it's doing the same thing. Uh, now the iliacus difference is that the psoas does have an effect on the lumbar spine. Iliacus does not directly. It does indirectly because if the if the if the femur is stable and it contracts, it's going to pull the pelvis into an anterior pelvic tilt. That anterior pelvic tilt is going to pull on the sacrum, and that sacrum is going to pull in the lumbar spine into extension. But in terms of the psoas actually being able to do lumbar flexion directly, uh, the iliacus does not have that ability. Uh, the other muscle here in, is the pectineus, and the pectineus is a hip flexor. You can kind of see the action here. It is part of the adductor group. Um, it can do hip adduction, but because of the angle and where it's at, it, it's really um, looked upon as a, as a hip flexor. But it does hip flexor, uh, as you can see here, the way it pulls, it can do some external rotation. Um, what you're going to find in a lot of textbooks is there's a lot of discrepancy between what the adductors can do in terms of transverse plane motion. And really the adductors can do everything except for abduction. So the adductors, depending upon the position of the femur, it can do uh, external rotation and they can also do internal rotation. They can do hip flexion and sometimes they can do extension but they can always do adduction. But the pectineus uh, is con considered a hip flexor. You can do a little bit of hip flexion, adduction, uh, and a little bit of external rotation. And its attachment is along the entire ramus of, that, uh, of the pubic. So here's the anterior view. There's your pubic symphysis here. And then here's that bone, and it attaches right on the backside of the femur there. Uh, your next muscle is the rectus femoris. Um, this is the uh, biarticulate muscle that's a hip flexor and a knee extensor. It's one of the four muscles of the, qua uh, the quadricep muscles. You have vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and underneath here you have vastus intermedius. So it's superficial, so it's the muscle you see the most. And it attaches right up and attaches both to the AIIS and a little bit into the, um, into the uh, groove of the acetabulum, so right above the hip. So it is a solid, direct hip flexor, and it does um, primarily hip flexion and knee extension. But in terms of uh, the hip and pelvis, we're doing, uh, we're looking at the hip flexor there. A uh, new muscle for most of us is the sartorius. Um, it attaches to the ASIS, so just above the rec fem. And it comes down, and this is labeled as the longest muscle of the body because it attaches all the way up here at the top of the hip, comes all the way down, and attaches below the knee. And there's a little attachment here called the pe pes anserine, and I'll have spelling for that uh, later. But there's a conglomerate of three muscles, the hamstring muscle and the gracilis all attached down here. Um, and it's considered the tailor's muscle because if you were to if you were to sit and take your leg and cross your legs, so if you were sitting down and took your ankle and put it on your opposite knee, um, ma making a figure four, this muscle does all three of those actions. It does hip flexion, hip external rotation, and knee flexion. 
right? So even standing there, if you were to stand upright and take your right foot and put it on front of your left knee, so you try to bring that leg up, that's your sartorius working all three planes, all three movements all at once, right? So that's it for the anterior muscles. We're going to look at the medial muscles, so most of the adductor group. So we already looked at pectineus. Um, the two muscles then are the adductor brevis and adductor longus. You'll see this often, especially as we get down, you'll see a brevis and a longus. And they're usually paired. You, If you have a brevis or you have a longus, or if you have one or the other, you're going to have both. So like peroneal brevis, peroneal longus, uh, adductor longus, adductor brevis. Uh, it's just like your long muscle and your your secondary muscle, right? So your primary and your secondary. Um, it is cool to know that there's two different adductors, but they basically do the same thing. So adductor longus and adductor brevis, they do adduction in in your static anatomy. Uh, at, towards the end of this lecture, I'll show a couple slides of how these adductors do it all, except for abduction. But um, these muscles make up the groin. So you have here uh, on your ischial tuberosity, um, so here's your, here's where your pectineus is at. Let me draw that out there. So your pectineus is um, here. That's where it attaches, and it comes in. It just starts right above the adductor brevis. Then you have adductor brevis, and then you start adductor longus, and then you have adductor magnus. But most of your adductor complex is on the inside part of your groin here. And then, so there's pectineus, adductor longus, uh, adductor brevis is kind of tucked underneath. And then we have our adductor magnus, which is the big guy. So now what's cool about the adductor magnus is that it actually has, uh, you can see, you can see these fibers here that are running more horizontally. And you can see more of these fibers that are running vertically. So you have an anterior head and posterior head, sometimes referred to as an adductor head and your hamstring head. And because of these vertical orientation of these fibers, these are actually really powerful hip extensors, um, just like the hamstrings are. They can do adduction, but they're pretty big, pretty much involved in uh, in extension as well of the hip. And then you have these large, massive sheath that goes the entire length of the femur. So this magnus is huge. It's actually the second largest muscle of the lower extremity, just behind the glute max. So this is a big muscle, big, big muscle. And then your other like random adductor is this gracilis, and you can see that it shares an attachment point where the sartorius, so the sartorius came down, wrapped around, and kind of attached here. Um, it is also a hip flexor, knee flexor, uh, and it, it doesn't really have a line of pull for rotation, but if it was going to do anything, it might do internal rotation. So your sartorius is, is uh, external rotator, and your gracilis is internal rotator. That's where these two differ, but they do the exact same action at the hip in terms of sagittal plane motion and the knee sagittal plane. So they're hip flexor, knee flexor, but the sartorius is an external hip rotator where the gracilis is an internal uh, hip rotator because of the where it's at in the line of pull. So they're moving into the posterior aspect. So as we expect, uh, the bulk of our muscles here are the hamstring group. And the hamstring really is uh, three muscles. So your biceps femor femoris and then your semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis. Uh, semi but the biceps is has two separate divisions, has a long head and a short head. And the primary difference is that the long head, um, it you can see here, it attaches up here at the ischial tuberosity with the rest of the hamstring group. Let me see my uh, next view here is the short head. The short head does not cross the hip, so it is actually a monoarticular muscle. It only crosses at the knee, and it, and it does knee flexion, whereas all the other three hamstring muscles, they do knee flexion and hip extension. So as with the uh, vertical fibers of the adductor magnus, um, it, it's a kind of part of the hamstring group because it does hip extension. Um, a lot of these muscles are all redundant. So you have adductor magnus, semimembranosis, semitendinosis, and only the long head of the bicep all acting as hip extensors at the hip because it crosses there. But the short head of the bicep starts here. And, and the relationship here between the long head of the bicep and the short head of the bicep are similar to the iliopsoas group. So iliopsoas with the iliacus and psoas, they have different originations, but they have the same insertion. 
the exact same thing here. This long head of the bicep and the short head of the bicep become one muscle right about here. And it becomes one tendon right there onto the head of the fibula. But the origination is, is different. The, the long head of the bicep originates right up here at the ischial tuberosity. And the short head originates down the length of the lower half of the femur. Then you have your two different muscles, your semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Uh, your semitendinosus has this really long tendon that goes posteriorly, but then it goes around and wraps around the front of the leg. And it actually goes and attaches where the gracilis and the uh, sartorius is at. And then the semimembranosus is a bigger, flatter, so think of uh, membrane, right? It's more bulky muscle. It lays down as the foundation and then semitendinosus right on top of that. But they have near identical uh, function. The only main difference here is that the um, attachment sites are a little separate. You more have medial versus lateral, but they uh, they come down and they they basically act as one hamstring. And they do um, knee internal rotation, whereas the bicep femoris does knee external rotation. So think of it as like two guide wires. This is coming down here and attaching on this side. And so it's going to pull the foot back and it's going to do right external rotation of the foot. Whereas the hamstring semitendinosus and semimembranosus, hip extension, knee flexion, but it's going to do knee internal rotation. But we'll talk about knee stuff next, uh, next uh, chapter. So now we move away from the thigh and we're moving up a little bit for the glute max, which is the largest muscle of the body. And the glute max is, uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, development. Uh, you can see here that it, it actually attaches to three bones. It attaches to the, to the ilium. It attaches through the entire sacrum and it also attaches to the coccyx. And it actually has three divisions. You have your, your um, ilio division, you have your sacral division, and you have your co coccygeal fibers. Um, and it is a powerful hip extensor, but is a huge hip abductor and a very, very powerful external hip rotator. But it influences the pelvis as well because it, it can pull that, that sacrum, it can pull the, um, the pelvis back, and it does that posterior pelvic tilt. So it has a big influence over lumbar positions as well. Now what's really interesting is that it has, um, let me see if I can do this here. Oops. We'll zoom in here. So you can see where the um, attachments are here. This is that... Um, Iliac, iliacal fibers, the sacral fibers, and the coccygeal fibers. But then it comes over here and it shoots down and you can see this is the greater trochanter. And about 50% of the muscular attachment, up to 60%, is actually not into a bony aspect. It actually goes into the uh, iliotibial band. And it's this glute max that actually creates the iliotibial band. So the leg musculature here is wrapped in, in fascia. And what happens over time is that where the glute max attaches, that gets thicker from all the contraction, all the force, all the tension, and you start to get this thickened band of tissue. But that nice thickened band that we see is, is a dissection. It, we don't normally see that in our, uh, you wouldn't find that in a cadaverous specimen, but what you, it's cut out to give that effect of that IT band. And we'll talk a little bit later in that. I'll show a couple slides on that. But it's interesting to look at that this is um, that most of the attachment is through that IT band. So here's the IT band there. You're seeing that there. We can zoom in here. And, uh, you know, right there, there's IT band. You can see that only a little bit is actually in the femur, and the bulk of it uh, connects into this connective tissue. So just keep, in mind, keep that in mind, and we'll uh, look at that a little later. So if you remove the glute max, you would find glute medius. And if you look here, the glute medius is the equivalent to the deltoid of the shoulder. And as you got, most of you uh, know that you have people that train their anterior deltoid, posterior deltoid, middle deltoid. Well, with the glute medius, you actually have three unique divisions. You have an anterior division, you have a middle division, and you have a posterior division. And each division, when you're looking at frontal plane motion for ad abduction, uh, they all work together. But you can see here that the glute minimus or medius also does hip flexion and hip extension. So the anterior fibers will be doing hip flexion while the posterior fibers are doing hip extension. They can also do internal external rotation. So your, your front fibers, your anterior fibers are going to pull this forward and in. You're going to do internal rotation. 
and your posterior fibers are going to pull back and out or external rotation. So this is a very versatile muscle, glute medius. It gets a lot of attention in therapy, rehab, um, because it's it can do a lot. It can do a lot. So it's not just an abductor. It's a flexor, extensor, internal, external rotator. So it can be an agonist and an antagonist to itself. Your next muscle is the glute minimus. So if we look even further, and it too, it has, has a, a bias towards more of an anterior aspect. So it's more of a hip flexor and an internal rotator. But it can do a little bit of uh, external rotation and hip extension. But uh, you can see here that unlike the when the glute uh, medius came down, it was right in the middle of this greater trochanter. So it could it was right in the middle balanced. This one kind of attaches more to the front. So it's a more powerful hip flexor than extensor. But it can do abduction, as you would expect. But it does internal rotation, external rotation, flexion, and extension. So the last muscle here is the tensor fascia lata, or the TFL. And uh, it's a little tiny muscle, and it has 100% of its attachment into the IT band. And this muscle is supposed to be the antithesis to the glute max, which is the largest and most powerful muscle of the body. And we can kind of look here. You can see there's a big size discrepancy here. You can see glute max versus TFL. And you can say, well, why is this so unequally distributed? So if you look over here real quick, we'll look and see what the, the function is, is that the TFL is a hip flexor and a hip abduc uh, abduction. So abduction, same as glute max. And then what it also does, and actually it's not showing it here, but it's showing it here, is it's one of the only muscles of the body that is a designated internal hip rotator. And if you go back and you look at all these muscles and when you go through your studies, especially the next slide, um, there are lots of muscles in the hip that are dedicated to external hip rotation and very little um, hip internal rotation. doesn't mean we have, don't have a lot of internal hip rotators. It just means that like uh, this rotation, like glute medius and glute minimus, they happen to do rotation, but they're really abductors. And even the adductors, they can do some rotation, but we don't have any dedicated uh, rotators like we do here. We have these uh, deep external hip rotators, these are all designated to, all dedicated to external hip rotation. That's all they do. So let me go back here, sorry. So when we look over here, we see glute max and TFL. This is huge, and this is tiny, but these are the, this is the agonist-antagonist balance, right, the tug of war. And the reason why the TFL is so tiny, it doesn't have to be very big. Glute max, its role is to overcome gravity. It's a primary anti-gravity muscle. So your body naturally wants to, if you were to someone, if you were standing and someone knocked you out, if and your body went into a default position, which is the fetal position, that would produce hip flexion, internal rotation, and adduction. So gravity naturally is pulling your hips into internal rotation. You don't need any extra muscles to pull you into that. What you do need is you need a really robust external rotation uh, development to control or decelerate you into internal rotation. So TFL actually has the weight of gravity behind it, so it doesn't need to be so big, whereas glute max is a um, anti-gravity muscle. It has to overcome. That's why it has to be so big. So this is actually equally balanced based on their function and role. So as I was saying earlier, the glute max has most of its attachment to the IT band, and now in this image here, you can kind of see the IT band, and it's um, uh, so right through here, you can see how the IT band is uh, cut out. This doesn't exist. This leg, this white material, would cover the entire leg. But just in cadaver specimens, they cut this out because this is thicker. It's about two or three millimeters thicker than the rest of the leg fascia. It's because the TFL and the glute max pulling on this all the time. Now, this is really thick tissue. And you get people that are always trying to roll out their IT band or stretch their IT band. It's total bullshit. You actually can't. This tissue is not meant to be stretched. This is meant to distribute forces. It's meant to, when the glute tugs on this, this is meant to transmit the tension being generated here right down into the knee so that the muscle can do its job. So when people actually get relief or, or from that, it's usually because they're lengthening this muscle up here or this muscle here. This is really where the attention should be for IT band issues. Now, there are six muscles that make up the deep external hip rotators. Uh, you have obturator, internus, externus. Uh, internus, externus isn't talking about internal, external rotation, just who's deeper, who's more superficial. The only muscle here that I'm really going to talk about is the piriformis, because the piriformis 
is um, is a muscle that's indicated quite a bit with sciatic nerve issues. Uh, reason is is that this muscle actually attaches on the back side of the sacrum, on the inside of it, and comes through, and the sciatic nerve usually either penetrates through the muscle or comes close to it, and if this muscle becomes tight or irritated, it puts pressure on that nerve and causes issue there. But outside of that, all these muscles do the exact same thing, which is external hip rotation, maybe a little bit of, of abduction, but uh, we haven't got to it yet, but the rotator cuff of the shoulder, and people are usually are familiar with the rotator cuff because the rotator cuff tears, but the rotator cuff is to the shoulder, these deep external hip rotators are to the hip. They're more of a stabilization. Their real job is to make sure that they pull this head of the femur really in tight in the acetabulum. So they're more stabilizers than they are external rotators, but they just happen to do external hip rotation. But in terms of memorizing the muscle, just knowing that all these muscles here, all six of these, piriformis, gemellus, the obturator, and the quadratus, these do external hip rotation. So these images aren't in your textbook. Um, I pulled these from um, Donald Newman's book, Kinesiology of the Musculoskeletal System, which is a great book. If you're planning on going to PT school, you're going to end up getting that book anyways, but it's, it's, it is probably my favorite book. Actually, most of these images have been pilfered from that. It's just a great book. It's really detailed. That's why I don't use it for this class, but I do like some of their images. And what I really like about this and the next three images is it kind of shows that um, relationship of where the muscle attaches based on its muscle function. So when you look here, what you'll see is the the relative axis of rotation. And remember, if anything's on that side of the axis, it's going to contribute as an agonist. And if it's on the other side of the axis, it's going to work as an antagonist. And so you can kind of see here the distance, the moment arm that it has, the leverage it has. And um, I'll start, let me get my pen out. We can start to mark some of these out. So we're looking at flexion on this side and extension on this side. And of course, if the extension is acting as an agonist, these all these become the antagonists. And if these are the agonists, all these become the uh, antagonists. Now, remember, I, do, I have glute med and glute minimum here as flexors. But remember, they can actually play both ways, flexion, extension, depending upon if you're talking about the anterior division or the posterior division. But here you have iliopsoas. You can see it's moment arm here, rec fem. So I would use these next three slides in the slides that I study for when you're trying to figure out agonists and antagonists and just make sure that you are paying attention to glute medius and glute minimus. Are you talking about anterior fibers or posterior fibers because they can play both ways. So when you look at the frontal plane, here's your theoretical uh, axis rotation. And you can see your, um, you know, some of your deep external hip rotators they, they either do abduction, adduction, depending upon where they're at. But you can see the TFL, glute medius, glute minimus, as your abductors, and then your adductors here. Um, and then with your internal rotators, like I said, you got TFL, glute med, glute min, and, and sometimes your adductors, depending upon your starting position. But for the most part, we're predominantly external rotation because we're overcoming gravity. So great slides to kind of study, look at. Um, but make sure you're using these lists for your agonists and antagonists. So let's do a little application. Um, we'll review this again towards the in the last unit after we go through hip and knee. We look at uh, an ankle. We look at integration. But I just want to point out some of the key kinesiology aspects. These slides here again are for your own study. You kind of see the arrows of force and what they're doing. But when we look at the adductor group. Um, Here's your adductor magnus, and it's layered up. You have your deep layer, middle layer, and superficial layer. And you can see how these are sandwiched together. But remember, most anatomists are looking at the human body in the anatomical position. And so they're looking at the hip in neutral, both in terms of flexion and extension and abdomen abduction. So when you look at the adductor function, they're going to pull this femur right into, uh, right towards midline, so adduction. But what's really neat is that in, let's say, especially in running or uh, any kind of gait, when the leg is back behind yourself, so if your leg is already in extension or your pelvis is forward, your adductors can actually work as hip flexors to a certain point. And then if, conversely, if you look at the leg, if it's already in flexion, this, um, the adductors will work when they contract. They're not just doing adduction, but they're bringing the leg back down to neutral. So the adductors, what they're doing is they're trying to bring the leg back if it's forward or trying to bring the back, leg forward if it's back and always trying to bring it in. 
right? So it can work as a flexor if the leg's already extended, or it can work as an extensor if the leg's always flexed, already flexed. So something to think about, particularly some questions when you're looking at functionality um, with adduction. That's why uh, your groin injuries are pretty common in runners, um, is that they're doing a lot of this flexion, extension, flexion, extension, and trying to stabilize, and so your uh, adductor muscles become quite a bit. And, you know, um, with this adductor magnus right here, a lot of times people will say they have a hamstring pull, but they really have an adductor magnus or a groin pull. You can kind of see the adductors working with the abductors with like a soccer kick, right? So legs coming forward. Um, you can kind of see in action here the adductors working in play. Um, when you're kicking that leg forward, you're having adduction happening at, the, at this hip, but you're having abduction occurring here in order to stabilize or to clear that leg. So there's quite a bit of relationship between adductors and abductors um, when you're looking at cross type of movements for agonist, antagonist, or, or at least synergist type activity. The next slide here is looking at external rotation. So, um, you know, we looked at the pelvis in terms of pelvic rotation and uh, lumbar rotation with the back, and we're looking at the, uh, you know, uh, ipsilateral. So we're looking at, let's say we're looking at um, left trunk rotation, right? So left pelvic rotation. So this left pelvis is coming backwards. So that would be left trunk rotation. So that would be left, the same side erector spinae, same side internal oblique contralateral external oblique, contralateral transverse spinalis or multifidus group. And now we have to look at too, how is that occurring because we're getting pelvic motion, what's happening at the hip. So left pelvic rotation with the foot stand on the ground is the equivalent of right external hip rotation. So you'd be getting glute medius, posterior fibers, all these deep external hip rotators, glute max, glute minimus. And if you open up that left foot, like say you're gonna turn to your left, that would be, um, you know, or if your foot, that would be external hip rotation as well. Or if that foot was stable on the ground, that would be creating internal hip rotation, which would be like TFL, anterior fibers of glute medius, and so forth. So I know that was quite a bit of information, but if you go back and replay the video and you have your notes in front of you, uh, it should help you make sense of that. So this is the fun part. This is where we start looking at how do we create an anterior posterior pelvic tilt. For those that are personal training or those that are working, you realize that this right here is one of the hardest things to get people to do because as a society we spend so much time with our hamstring dominant type activity our tailbone tucked under ourselves because we're sitting and this flat butt syndrome right and getting people to do this becomes problematic and the reason why it's hard to do this is that this becomes the new normal hamstrings become tight uh, abdominals become tight and um, we become weak in the glute max and these lower back muscles and some of these hip flexors and these uh, psoas muscles become weak and we need to strengthen those in order to get to this anterior pelvic tilt. But basically what you're seeing here is those coupled motions. And so if I'm trying to do an anterior pelvic tilt, the same muscles that do anterior pelvic, there's no, there's no muscles that do anterior pelvic tilt. The muscles that do lumbar extension and hip flexion, they create an anterior pelvic tilt. And there's no muscles that do posterior pelvic tilt. The rectus femoris that are trunk flexors and the glute max and hamstrings that are hip extensors, they create a posterior pelvic tilt. So just make sure that the, the anterior and posterior pelvic, the pelvic movements are really byproducts of your extent, your trunk and your hip musculature. So this comes into play a little bit when we look at sit-ups. Uh, and so if I try to lift my legs up or if I try to bring my trunk up, um, I'm producing a strong moment of hip flexion which is then pulling the pelvis forward. Let me get my arrow here. So it's gonna pull the pelvis forward and if I have normal activation of the abdominal muscles, I'm gonna counteract that like lumbar extension, right? So you can see the space here on the ground versus here if you have reduced or weak abdominals because you're trying to do a leg lift or you're trying to do a sit up, you're gonna start jamming on the back. And this is actually where the myth came from that sit ups were bad for the back. So when you are, when you get someone that's out of shape that hasn't worked out in a while and they start doing sit-ups or leg lifts, they're going to have reduced activation of the abdominal muscles. They're not going to have this lumbopelvic complex under control. So, and only if they have pre-existing uh, conditions. So if they have a herniated disc here and they are jamming this into more lumbar extension, they probably could put more damage on their back.
So it doesn't mean that sit-ups are bad to do. Sit-ups, full sit-ups are actually great exercise, not to train the abdominals, but to train this lumbo-pelvic hip complex, right? To get better at being able to maintain spinal neutral as we do heavy loads down the lower extremities or heavy loads in the upper uh, torso here. So this kind of shows the what's happening with like a leg lift or sit-up and this normal neutral spine, right? Normal neutral pelvis. And the definition of neutral pelvis is that the AS, IS, and the pubic symphysis are relatively in the same plane. And you can see here that neutral is not being maintained at all because of the psoas and the rect and these muscles trying to come up. And you don't have enough uh, strength in the rectus abdominis to pull this into. Let me go back to the next slide. Maintain this neutral pelvis, right? Because the psoas is trying to pull the pelvis down. It's winning, and these muscles aren't strong enough to maintain that. And that's it for chapter eight. So uh, make sure you read through the pages there. Um, definitely do the review exercises. Um, and you can see that just I have a few of the first five here. And then play around with those lab exercises. These are things that we normally do in class or will do in class. Um, but um, on your own for study, uh, make sure you're doing these lab exercises and going through. Um, start studying the muscles now, particularly the muscles of the thigh, because they're going to help you with the knee and uh, we're only going to get more and more of uh, volume of content as we move forward, so make sure you're staying on top of it.